So, um, ladies and gentlemen, I want to talk about, and I want to speak specifically to my Christian brothers and sisters, and I want to talk to Christians about what the church needs from you. There's a number of times that the scriptures talk about standing firm in the faith, standing strong in the faith, standing on the faith is an essential part of the scriptural teaching. And if you don't believe me, just go and look it up in scripture yourselves. Go and do a Bible study on this phrase, stand firm in the faith. Because one of the first things that the church needs from you, my brothers and sisters, my fellow Christians, is that you should stand firm in the faith, in your heart, in your mind, and in your strength. What do I mean by in your heart? I mean that as a Christian, that you should guard your heart as it is the wellspring of life, so that your faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, your love for him and your commitment to him cannot be wavered or destroyed by mocking rebuke or by childish argument. That in your heart, your commitment to Christ is firm and complete. What does it mean to stand firm in the faith? Water, please. What does it mean to stand firm in the faith in terms of your mind? It means to be intellectually robust, to know your faith, to know what you believe, to know why you believe it, to know its nuances and its character, its shape and its form. And what does it mean to be standing firm in the faith in your strength? It means in your actions, in what you do, in where you spend your energy, in where you spend your time, in where you spend your money. Christians, we need to start standing firm in the faith as Christians. To love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul and with all our strength. To stand firm in the faith in our doctrines means to know what we believe as Christians. And by knowing what we believe as Christians, it means that we organize our life around those beliefs. To stand firm in the faith in terms of our values means that we know what those values are and we organize our lives around them. In terms of our ethical practice as Christians, we're called to live out our faith, that sense of virtue ethics, and to build our life on it and to conduct ourselves accordingly. And to understand that we as Christians have a history and to build our identity on that history as the church. And to live it out as a culture, taking territory, taking space, demanding that others clear away for us in commitment to our faith and in the practice of our faith. Christians must stand firm in the faith. We must cultivate spiritual practices that allow us to be strong in our faith, that cultivate the mindset and the heart and the emotional framework of being a strong Christian. And we have to stop being disheartened by the challenge that as Christians in the West we face. There's no denying it as Christians in the West we face many challenges. The church in the West is in retreat, it's on the back foot. But there's two ways you can respond to a challenge. You can cower from it, or you can rise up and you can take a stand. You can rise up and you can meet that challenge. The reality of the church in the West at the moment is that we don't cultivate strength of belief. We don't cultivate strength of heart. We don't cultivate strength of mind. We have a sloppy grasp of theology. We have a weak spirituality in the West. And that's why too many Christians give up the faith. 
because it never costs them anything to believe. But as a Christian, our faith should cost us something. It should cost us in terms of our time. It should cost us in terms of our energy. It should cost us in terms of the emotional cost, the financial cost of living as a Christian. The second thing that the church needs in the West is for you, my brothers and sisters, to unite, to unite across sectarian lines, to unite in terms of standing against the enemies of the church. And the two principal enemies of the church in the West are liberalism and Islam. These are the two principal enemies of the church. And those enemies pose such an existential threat to the church and to what it is to being a Christian that whatever sectarian differences we may have as Christians is secondary to the need to unite against the threat that the church faces. We must unite against the enemies of the church in terms of our activism, in terms of how we conduct ourselves in society, politics, economics and culture against those enemies of the church. And let that be the starting point of our unity as Christians. And then once you've established that unity in activism, then you can start to build other aspects of unity on top of that. As Christians, we need to learn to appreciate that not every difference between us as Christians is a life and death issue. Not every difference between Christians is worth separating the church out for. And this is particularly true if you're a Protestant Christian, if you're a Reformed Christian. Your differences with other Protestants and Reformed Christians, as you yourselves acknowledge, are only secondary. And if they are only secondary, then why do you divide yourselves? Why do you allow yourselves to be divided? Particularly amongst the Protestant and Reformed churches, there's greater scope for a full unity. And it is only because of the ambitions of your church leaders, the economics that surround being a leader of a church, and because of sectarian dogmatists that you allow yourselves to be divided. But nonetheless, the threats to the church and meeting those threats are of more importance to us as Christians. Consider the number of times that the scriptures appeal to us to be of one heart and to be of one mind, that state that we are one body, that we shouldn't divide the church. So surely all of this teaching puts a demand upon us as Christians to try to find ways to unite the church and not to divide the church. The third thing that the church in the West needs from you, my brothers and sisters, is that you should reject the failed way that we are doing church in the West without separating yourself from it. The parish system of the church in the West is not working. We can all see that it's not working. So why are we dying to keep this golden calf alive. The mega church, whilst being a better form of church than the parish church, is not working. So why are we fighting to keep this kind of church alive? Let us accept that this kind of church has failed, that you can't necessarily turn it around. Because, as Christians, we are too spread out and too divided. We need to have the courage 
to pursue creating a different kind of church. A church built upon a Benedict option. Now I realize as Christians, we can't get from A to Z like that. There's going to be a period of transition. And this is why as Christians, we shouldn't separate ourselves from those churches, but that we should, as Christians, work to transform those churches into something that is more akin to the Benedict option. The next thing that the church in the West needs from you, my brothers and sisters, is that you should become activists. Stop being keyboard warriors. Stop being people that sulk in your homes, despairing about how the world isn't going the way that you want it, saying that there is no hope. Stop being merchants of despair. The Christian heart is supposed to be a strong heart. It is supposed to be the heart of a warrior. And when you see an enemy, when you see a challenge, you rise to that challenge without shrinking. And the church needs you to be activists in society, seeking to transform the norms, the laws, the principles of society, its governing narrative. And how do you do that? You do it by firstly not compromising in places where Christians should not compromise. You do that by being an activist in the church itself, in the institution of the church, so that you oppose bishops and priests and pastors who divide the church and weaken the church by their sectarianism and by their opposition and, and cowardice in the face of liberal society or in the face of Islam. What we need as Christians are leaders that have the vision and ambition to lead the church in the fight that it is called to have against its enemies. And that means organizing the church in the way that it needs to be organized to win those battles. And you need to be an activist in making the church stronger. You need to be an activist in politics, opposing laws that dilute the strength of the church, opposing laws that increase Islamization or increase liberalization and seek to bring about laws that decrease Islamization and decrease liberalization. And the truth of it is, my brothers and sisters, that demographics always speak. And just as the Christians should form Benedict-style communities to influence their society, there is no point in diluting your witness as a Christian, there is no point diluting your witness in a political party, whatever that political party is. As Christians, we must form our own political parties. As Christians, you must be activists in economics. That means boycotting halal meat. It means boycotting companies that push the LGBTQ agenda. It means that you use your money as a weapon. And your money creates a weight in society. It means that Christians need to set up businesses. We need to create a network of Christian businesses and we need to get Christians to support those businesses. Christians also need to be activists in culture. 
and particularly you Christian artists, you have a big role to play in this. Because whatever is your form of art, that is your weapon. Use it. Use it to undermine the liberal narrative. Use it to undermine the hypocrisies of our society. Brothers and sisters, the church faces major challenges in the West. The way we have done things up to now clearly has not worked. Those challenges demand something of us. They demand us to exert ourselves to the triumph of the church in all spheres and against all enemies. We're not going to win by cowardice. We're not going to win by despair. We're not going to win by giving in to fear. We're not going to win by disunity. We're not going to win by cultivating a sloppy, weak theology in our heart. But we are going to win by unity, firmness, imagination, courage, conviction and commitment and that brings me to the final thing that we as Christians in the West need to cultivate to win in the West we need to create societies and networks that answer the major problems that the church is facing we need to network all of the believers to the apologists and the evangelists so that every believer knows an apologist or an evangelist that they can bring a seeker to. We need to reform the way we do evangelism in the West, abandoning the silly preaching in the street model and entering into dialogue and debate and discussion. We need to cultivate hospitality in our parish systems and in our churches so that when someone comes into the church they feel embraced we need to create networks of evangelists we need to create networks of christian lawyers networks of christian businesses networks of christian artists and when those bodies exist or where those networks exist, let's not reinvent the wheel. Get involved in those groups that are already existing. Let's take the practice of our faith to be broader than just doing charity work. As Christians, we need to create a culture and networks and organizations that build families and create families that marry single Christians. And we need to build as Christians legally constituted defense forces that can rise to the challenge of defending Christians when and where they are violently persecuted, legally constituted, as I've already said. Because the reality is that many churches and much in the church is not dealing with the challenges that the church faces. Thank you very much for your time. Any questions?